and welcome to Addicted to Murder. This is Courtney, licensed professional counselor with over a decade of experience. And this is Trisha. And today, Courtney, we're going to do a little spin on my little, you know, ditty that I do. Oh, okay. So what we're going to do is I'm going to give you a word that you, I'm sure, won't know. And mm-hmm. you're going to put it in a sentence. And then I'm going to reveal what you said. Okay. Your word is lolly banger. Lolly banger. Lolly banger. Mm. That dinner last night was a real lolly banger. This is what you said. That dinner last night was a type of gingerbread filled with raisins. Oh, I mean, that doesn't sound that bad. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, again. I would eat that for dinner. (laughs) On brand with your typical sweets. So It is. It's true. That was just something I thought might be funny, but I don't know. I like it. We'll see. Let's try one more. Okay. Okay. Let's do it. Your word is ugglesome. Ugglesome. Hmm. Um, I wish that I had an ugglesome puppy. What Courtney just said was she wishes she had a terrifying puppy. I mean, I kind of do have a terrifying puppy <laughs> she sometimes. Does. She has a German Shepherd that can be a it, little... She barks real loud. Yeah, she can be a little intense sometimes. So, But she's really sweet. So Yay, She is. Rika is mm-hmm. sweet. All right, well... Thanks for playing that question or that uh, game with me. No problem. Now yeah. I get to ask you a question. Yeah, it's question time. Yeah. All right. You ready? Yes. All right. So my question for this week is, what is something you thought you'd have already done by now, but haven't? Been a regular cast member on Days of Our Lives. I feel like there's a story behind that that I want to know. Well, no, I just, you know, grew up watching Days of Our Lives and wanted to be so badly on that soap opera and then I actually had a friend who um worked in Hollywood and she got me like a tour of the set um back when I was like 22 or something like that and I was just like this is this is my world this is where I need to be I want to be the next Sammy Brady or (laughs) Hope Brady or Nicole Walker or whomever and get to make out with EJ on set I can totally see that being you Mm -hmm. yeah it's like the fantasy world part of whatever I have going on. Right. (laughs) I don't like reality most of the time. So what about you? You know, mine's a little more boring, but really I wish, or I always thought that I would have traveled more internationally by now. And really, I haven't been out of the U.S. since I was like 19. Sounds like you went with your um, choir. Yeah, when I was 19. That was, and that was, you went to Greece and where else? Went to Greece and Bulgaria, which was really cool. Most but I, people haven't been there. That's true. But I would have thought that I would have been other places by now, too. I understand. It's yeah. on my list. Me, too. I would love to continue to travel. I don't care if it's internationally, just wherever. Yes. Because international flights are very long, but, you know, it's worth it. It is definitely worth it. Yeah. Well, good question. Thanks. So, yeah, we're part three of Kemper. Mr. Ed Kemper. Yeah. And I apologize, but it's going to be part... F- There's going to be four parts. So, I wasn't sure... Until I started, you know, keep going and going and going. So anyways, if you don't like Ed Kemper, sorry about that. But if you do, hopefully we will share some insights that maybe you don't know. Right. Maybe you're really excited about there being four parts to Ed Kemper. Yeah. Yeah. Could be. Do you want to recap um, last time? Sure. So in parts one and two of Ed Kemper, right, we learned that he was born into a kind of broken family, felt abandoned by his dad. His mom had a lot of issues, possibly borderline personality disorder, and was very kind of cruel and dismissive to him. Eventually, he started doing scary things like torturing and killing animals and whatnot, and was shipped off to his grandparents' house, where at the tender age of 15, he shot both of them and then turned himself in, was in a state hospital, with adults for several years, got out, started doing some college kind of stuff, and right at the very end there, he had committed his first murder, and then murders, that's right, double murder, Mm -hmm. of some hitchhikers, Mm -hmm. and had just been pulled over by the police not too long after. Yeah, and let go. Yes, with the bodies in the trunk. Exactly. Exactly. So there we are. All right. Thank you, Courtney. 
So when Ed got home after being pulled over and getting away with literal murder, Ed got the girls into his apartment. He stripped them down, chopped them up, fondled their organs, and violated at least one of their torsos. It was unclear if it was both torsos. While he was sodomizing these now unrecognizable bodies, he would sporadically stop to take pictures or take a break, you know, put some body parts into the bags that he wasn't using for later disposal. Quote, I remember there was actually a sexual thrill. You hear that little pop and pull their heads off and hold their heads up by the hair, whipping their heads off, their body sitting there. They'd get me off. Ed used the word pop in this situation as well as when he described destroying his siblings' Barbie dolls as a child. That was just something the author noted. He also robbed the girls of the little over $8 they had between them. He kept their body parts around for the night to play with. He spoke of how sometimes a limb or a head or a torso may fall off of the chair or table or whatever he had put them on and make like a thump on the floor. And he was on the upper level of this apartment building and the downstairs downstairs neighbors would complain of the noises coming from the apartment above. The following morning, he gathered the remaining parts in bags and drove to Loma Preta, a peak in the Santa Cruz Mountains, and tossed their parts haphazardly around the area. He memorized where he had dumped them so he could go back to see my girls whenever he wanted to. He was especially fond of Marianne Pesci. Um, And I just want to say, I believe last episode I said Marianne Pierce. Uh, I think it was an autocorrect and I didn't catch it. So it's Marianne Pesci. Quote, I was quite struck by her personality and her looks. There was almost a reverence there. He even would drive by her house afterward to feel close to her. Ed did keep these girls' skulls, a habit he would develop that he said so he could remember or continue to have, I'm sorry, Ed kept the skulls, a habit he would develop that he says was so he could continue to have irumacho. Do you know how to pronounce that? Um, Probably iromacho. Okay. With the heads. And that's a type of oral sex where the other partner's not having any sort of involvement. Okay, Courtney, you know what I'm going to ask you. What do you want to discuss regarding how he handled the killing of his first co-eds? And are you surprised that he is a necrophiliac? So what we are seeing here really is Ed finally being able to act out the scenarios that he'd been fantasizing about since he was literally a child. Um, You know, in a really awful way, we could even say that he was playing with the bodies of his victims. And, you know, being an adult now, this play is now tied very closely to sexual gratification. One thing that is a little different about Ed um, compared to some of the other killers we've talked about is that he does not seem to be aroused by the act of killing itself or of pain being inflicted through that death, but is more aroused by the dead bodies themselves, which is, as you said, called necrophilia. Um, And, you know, I'm not surprised by this, especially... If we look back at his childhood and when he talked about, you know, needing to kill his teacher first before he could kiss her, I think that's sort of an early iteration of what he's doing now. Can you think of another killer that we've done? Um, I mean, Jeffrey Dahmer comes to mind, but we haven't done him yet, where the act of killing is just a necessary part to what they really want. Mm. I'm, I'm trying to rack my brain and I'm not sure that... No one that comes to mind immediately. Yeah. So it's kind of an odd oddity about him. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. So eventually the heads uh, were too decomposed to hang on to, so Ed got rid of them similarly to the way he had disposed of their bodies. Ed would continue to think fondly of Marianne and probably still does until this day. Quote, she epitomized what really drove me. She was a haughty young lady, kind of stuck up, distant. I see a girl that was not beautiful. She was not plain. She was somewhere in between. She was caught up in that beauty thing, like kids in the valley are, valley girls. Ed referred to his victims as, quote, lovers, when he would return to their resting spots and visit them. After these kills and, or after these kills and days, if not weeks, of violating the remains, Ed is now in his cooling off period. He was still picking up hitchhikers, but not killing them or harming them in any way. He felt peaceful for now, but we know that serial killers all have a cooling off period that must end. His period lasted until September 14th, 1972, when Ed picked up 15-year-old Ikoku. Ikoku. 
yeah, sorry, at a bus stop near Berkeley. She was on her way to Korean dance class. When Ed offered her a ride, she hesitated, but Ed had developed a little trick that seemed to work with unsure girls. He would look at his watch like he was in a hurry, and that because of this, he couldn't possibly have time to harm anyone. Well, it worked on Aiko. She accepted the ride, and when she became suspicious during the ride, he told her that he was planning on killing himself, and he just didn't want to be you know, alone while he did it. He told her, quote, I just want a quiet place where we can tie you up, and then we can go to my place. He was flashing his 357 Magnum that he had borrowed from an acquaintance at this time. I don't know how, but somehow he did convince her that he wouldn't hurt her. I guess it's the mark of a master manipulator, I'm sure. In hindsight, she probably would have thought the story was crazy, but I guess it made sense to her at the time. Ed said she even started to laugh at his jokes and let him tie her up and tape her mouth. She even helped him put the tape on her mouth. She was laughing as she told him that the tape was too big for her small mouth and to get a smaller piece, to which Ed complied. He was, after all, used to being told what to do by women. Ed got out of the car and got in the back seat with Aiko. Aiko. He also, or he had left his gun in the front seat when he, you know, got out to get into the back seat, and she could have easily grabbed it, but she didn't. And then he asked her to unlock the back door, which she did. So the poor girl obviously was just so trusting and so naive. I mean, she was only 15. When she let Ed in, he grabbed her nose and pinched it close. So remember, she had her mouth taped, so he was trying to suffocate her. It worked. She passed out, but Ed thought that she was dead. Ed raped her body, and she awoke during the assault, and this really freaked Ed out. He had never had sex with a living woman before, and he got really angry, probably at himself for this mess up in his plan, or maybe her too, I don't know, but he tried again. This time, he did succeed in violently suffocating her until she did die. He raped her again, and just to be sure she was really dead, he strangled her with her own scarf. He put her body in the trunk and went near his home, where he stopped to have a few beers. Ed explains that he always got very thirsty when he murdered women, sort of like Richard Ramirez was. Um, Then he checked again to make sure that she was dead. Courtney, Ed has not had sex with a living person before this encounter, um, if you want to call this encounter having sex with a living person. And to be truthful, he didn't think he'd be having sex with a live person at this time. Is there anything you want to talk about regarding his disgust or fear of sex with a living person? Do you think most, if not all, necrophiles would rather have sex with the dead and only the dead? So necrophilia, by definition, is the sexual attraction to dead bodies, you know, which means that, yes, necrophiles do prefer to have sex with corpses compared to living bodies. And, you know, most people with necrophilia, however, don't become killers. They tend to live in their fantasy life or find work where they might have access to bodies, such as being like a coroner or a mortician or or something in that field. Um, again, not generalizing, but everybody in that field has necrophilia. I was just going to say, do you think that there's a high probability of most people in that field have a necrophilia type no, of situation? No, I don't okay. think it is. Um, okay. It's actually a pretty rare phenomenon. Okay. Um. But one of the main motivations that they have identified in studies with people with necrophilia um, is that they have this desire to be with an unresisting and unrejecting partner. Um, You know, and I think this idea fits well with what we know of Ed, right? He was not popular with the ladies, you know, because of his size and his immaturity about dating and sex. And then, you know, the main woman in his life, his mother, was often cruel and rejecting. And so I think it felt almost like just a really safe way to be in control of of those sexual situations. And his grandma, too. Right. I mean, pretty much everyone he interacted with that was important to him. Right. Probably his sisters. Yeah. Well, the next morning, Ed worked on dismembering the body. It took him over four hours Ed would go back and forth on if he had sex with the torso of Iko. He also said he ate part of Iko's body in in some interviews, and then he recanted it in others. So remember, we're dealing with a serial killer, and although he is very forthcoming, you never quite know what is the truth. He then scattered the remains around mountainous areas nearby. Ed did keep the head as he had with his previous victim's head. He also found her address and went by her house as well. Soon after he killed Iko, Ed traveled to Fresno to meet with two court-ordered psychiatrists. He was trying to get his previous record to be sealed. Oh yeah, at this time, while he was visiting these two psychiatrists, Iko's head was in the trunk of the car 
um, at the meeting. And he fooled the psychiatrist, of course. He, you know, quote, he has made an excellent response to the years of treatment. I see no psychiatric reason to consider him to be a danger to himself or any other member of society. And the other psychiatrist said this, quote, he appears to have made a good recovery from such a tragic and violent split within himself. He appears to be functioning in one piece now, directing his feelings towards verbalization, work, sports, and not allowing neurotic buildup with himself. Courtney, I wonder how many criminals do indeed fool the mental health providers that assess them. Do you have any thoughts on that? I mean, psychology is not and cannot be a, you know, 100 percent hard science um, accuracy, you know, in part because there's this sort of unwritten expectation that the patients are going to be honest with the mental health providers. And, you know, as a therapist, I can only make assessments and interventions based on the information I'm, I am given. And I've definitely had clients that kept major things secret from me, you know, and there are probably many criminals that are able to work the system, especially if they have any kind of higher score on the psychopathy scale because, you know, lying would come easy to them and they wouldn't have any qualms about it. Mm-hmm. You know, and and Ed particularly was adept, you know, given his intelligence level and then his experience and understanding of psychology and the psychometric assessments um, that he helped research when he was at the state hospital. Well, this meeting worked. He got his way and his records were sealed. So now, like, he would not come up on a background check. Um, You know, the local police in the area would not be privy to why he was, you know, it's basically like what he did doesn't exist anymore. He could be a cop if he wanted. He could work at a school. He could work with children. He could do anything. Um, So he could also now legally purchase firearms. And that's exactly what he did. He promptly went out and got himself a twenty two Ruger pistol. And after Ed got his gun, he claims that he needed to kill. It intensified the feeling. And at this point, it had been four months since his last kill. Quote, I can feel it consuming my insides, this fantastic passion. It was overwhelming me. If that gun comes out, something has to happen. The day he bought the gun, in fact, he went out looking for his next victim. Cynthia Shaw was 19 years old and going to Cabrillo College in Aptos. He picked her up hitchhiking and, you know, she, they did the, and did the same thing. She was hesitant, so he pretended to look at his watch to assure her he had no time for foul play. And that got her to take the ride. He pulled the gun on her, gave the crap story about him being suicidal, etc. Courtney, he must have been one convincing giant ass hat of a man. He told her he had to make a stop to say goodbye to his mother and asked that she get into the trunk to hide, and she did. And then, you know, once she was in the trunk, Ed pulled out his gun and shot her in the head. Um, Courtney, I want to talk a little bit how Ed does not appear to want to torture his victims. I know we touched on this before, but we're seeing it again. Um, We see that he's not interested in live rape or trying to hurt them, and this is a little different from most killers we see. He's, He's not a sadist. What do you think about this? Like I mentioned earlier, right, the act of killing and the related pain and suffering of the victim is not the main sexual drive for Ed, uh, like we've seen with many of our other killers who get sexual arousal from the act of killing itself. Um, You know, the psychopath part of him, because that was definitely there, likely, you know, enjoyed the power and control involved in the killing, but he wasn't like aroused by it. The murder was more of a means to an end to get a dead body that he could then, um, you know, use for sexual gratification in different ways. And I imagine like something like grave robbing or something wouldn't appeal to him because he didn't know that person first and, you know, have that at least a little bit of a connection that he has with them before he kills them. I don't know. That's just a guess. Quite possibly. And, you know, grave robbing... You know, grave robbing, I mean, it takes a weirdly large amount of effort to dig True. up a body and hope that it's still a body and not just a skeleton. And Yeah. You know, there's a lot more involved with that. Maybe we'll get into that someday. Maybe. Ed said this when he saw how efficient shooting his victims in the head were. Quote, it amazed me so much because one second she's animated and the next she's not. And there's absolutely nothing in between. Just noise and absolute stillness. 
Ed took Cynthia to his mother's and hid her there until he could properly take care of the body. So Cynthia was bigger than his previous victims. They all were about five foot tall, 100 pounds. And Cynthia was five foot five and 160 pounds. So she was heavier and a little harder to hide, but also appealing to the large Ed. He did remove her head and used it to gratify himself. He wanted to keep her close to him. So he, when he was done with the head, buried her head in the courtyard close to his mom's window and positioned it so it was looking upwards. Quote, sometimes at night I talk to her, saying love things, the way you do to a girlfriend or a wife. He dumped the rest of, the, of her remains along the road in Big Sur. This location was one he knew would be discovered, and it was, the next day by a patrol officer. Other body parts, other body parts of um, his victims were being discovered at this time as well, and the police were piecing together that there may be one or even two serial murderers in the area. They thought it might be a duo based on the different ways the victims were killed. They dubbed the murderer the chopper and the butcher. They saw the pattern and linked it to hitchhiking and advised women to not hitchhike, especially alone. It also said that he positioned her head that way because her mo- his mother always wanted someone to be looking up to her, and she was in the ground. So, hmm. anyhow. As Ed continues to kill, this time a month later, a pattern is emerging. Well, another pattern, much like Arthur Shawcross. Ed seems to make his decision to kill after he has a fight with his mother. And on February 5th, 1973, after a big fight with his mother, he went out to hunt. Quote, I was so pissed. I would have killed anybody who got into the car. Rosalind Thorpe, 22, was the unfortunate recipient of Ed's ride and rage. Ed had outfitted his car with a university staff sticker that he got from his mom to make people feel safe taking rides from him. Some of the university posters advised that it was safe to take a ride from staff members. Rosalind accepted the ride from Ed, and then Ed decided to pick up another young woman. Alice Liu also accepted a ride from Ed, and probably both of the young women felt assured by the other's presence that this was a safe ride. After Ed had both his passengers in tow, he raised his gun and shot both of them where they sat. He didn't even stop the car to do this. Alice was in the backseat trying to dodge the gun, and he struggled to shoot her to death. But eventually he did. I imagine the car was driving erratically while that was happening. Soon after, he stopped the car and put the bodies into the trunk, then went to a gas station to fill up. A screw-up on his part to need to, to need to do this. He then drove to his mother's place and dismembered the girls in the trunk in the driveway. He literally was hacking the bodies of two women in a trunk in the driveway of a suburban street without trying to hide what he was doing. I mean, it was dark, it was 10.30, but it wasn't that late. Anyone could have walked or driven by. Courtney, do you think Ed's behavior is an example of how he thinks he is superior and doesn't think he can get caught? Or do you think his sloppiness is um, a result of him just not caring if he gets caught? Is it apathy? You know, these murders remind me a little bit of Ted Bundy when he was in Florida, kind of at the end of his kind of spree and it seems to be very just like acting on impulse and rage. And I think that Ed was really agitated, um, you know, by his rage towards his mother and was sort of just acting on that emotion. And, you know, we know that sort of biologically in our brain, when our emotions get really high, especially emotions like anger and fear, um, the parts of our brain that are really good at thinking ahead and planning and logic and caring about consequences. Um, They're just not getting as much blood flow and activation. Um, So if he was acting on the, this feeling of rage, he wasn't thinking about, well, if I do this in the middle of the driveway at night, people are going to come by. He was just kind of lost in that moment of emotion. Interesting. That's my guess. Well, it's better. Good as mine. Right. (laughs) The next morning, Ed wrapped one of the torsos in a blanket and in broad daylight brought it inside the house to have sex with it. He also brought in the head from the other victim to watch the heinous sex act. Now, because of all the previous co-eds that had gone missing, these two were noticed right away and search parties were dispatched. Ten days after searching, a row crew found, well, you know, the mysterious mannequins in the woods. Oh, wait, no, 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 not a mannequin. Again, you know. Is it ever? I know we've brought this up before, but I still don't understand. I frequently throw mannequins in the you woods. Know. Anyhow, they, not to make light of this at all, but it was bodies of the young women, and um, they were in multiple pieces. They were dumped 
unlike the others, they were dumped together and near a body of water where people hung out. So it was like a busy place. Quote, as my crimes went on, I became more and more ill and I took fewer and fewer precautions, both in my approach during and after, which seemed obvious to me given the growing amount of evidence that was discovered in one form or another. Okay, Courtney, let's analyze what's going on with Ed now. I'm assuming you are sure he is a far gone sociopath or psychopath, not a sadist but possibly something else. He has killed many women by now, quicker and quicker each time. He is careless with his handling of their remains at this point and almost seems bored by the kill. He claims he loves them and keeps items and goes to their houses to learn more about them. He visits their resting places because he wants to feel close to them. They are his. What do you think? I would classify Ed as a psychopath with necrophilia. You know, he is killing in order to satisfy his sexual urges to fully possess the women by having sex with and then dismembering their bodies. And as with many killers and sex offenders, right, so much of it boils down to control. Ed was able to control these women, do whatever he wanted to them, and they couldn't reject him. As for, you know, keeping trophies and visiting their remains, learning about them post-mortem, I think there are kind of two parts to this behavior— The first, as is true for many other killers, you know, the trophies and visits are a way to remember and relive the crime over and over. The other, and this of course is just conjecture on my part, um, is that in a way these were Ed's romantic relationships. These were his girlfriends, so to speak. Mm -hmm. You know, he experienced physical closeness and intimacy And, at least on his end, a strong dose of hormones like dopamine and oxytocin that contribute to feelings of love and bonding with these women, even if they were already dead and not able to feel the same. So it kind of reminds me of, like, a guy who can't get over his exes, and so he holds onto their stuff in, like, a little box in the closet and keeps going back to it or Mm -hmm. drives past their house hoping to see them in the window, but obviously just in a much more twisted way so in his way this is how ed loves i suppose you could say that okay well during this time when edwin was in another cooling period he would hang out at the gun shop or the jury room and he'd listen to the clientele and some of them were cops and they would be talking about the killer he would chime in on occasion and put on his gentle giant or annoying nuisance act No one suspected him at all. He was even on a first-name basis with some of the lead investigators on the case. Quote, I had no problem getting information out of these officers. Why? Well, they see themselves as the cream of the crop. I was doing a little bragging around these simple cops. I didn't care about being their friend. I had already been in prison. I didn't like the police. But they were talking to each other about what they heard about the case. Just a side note, I just think it's kind of weird that he doesn't like cops. You know, most killers probably don't like them, but so many of them want to be a cop. All right, so this is something I hadn't known about Ed Kemper. He actually dated a person in a normal capacity. Her name is unknown, uh, but she was 17 and blonde. And two days after the murder of Aiko Ku, Aiko Ku, Aiko or Aiko, I'm sorry, I'm not sure which way it's pronounced. He was having a nice evening with her and her parents. He even proposed to her and she accepted. Ed did not think about killing her. Why we don't know much about her is because after Ed was caught, her parents were effective about keeping their names out of the press and they moved away. Courtney, I wonder if they had a physical relationship or if they were going to wait until they were married to consummate the relationship. I wonder if they would have tied the knot had he continued not continued down his path. He does claim that she is the main reason why he stopped when he did um, in his way. Ed was now growing weary about what he was doing. He craved the release but did not relish the way he obtained it. Quote, Toward the end, I became sicker, bloodthirsty, and yet these streams of blood annoyed me. It's not something I want to see, but what I long for is to witness death and to savor the triumph that I associated with it. My own triumph over the death of my victim. Overcome death. They are dead and I am alive. It's a personal victory. Courtney? We have seen time and time again that serial killers are able to maintain what at least appear to be normal relationships. Even while they are actively um, going around and murdering. So while I also did not know this about Ed um, before now... 
I'm not totally surprised if you especially was trying to, you know, put on that face of being a normal person. Um, but I'm also not surprised that the girl was only 17 either. You know, as Ed was kind of socially immature from his time at the state hospital, so he would probably be more likely to relate to a girl that age than to, you know, a woman his own age in like his Mm -hmm. mid-20s. As for Ed's quote um, that you just shared, I think this again points to the idea of the feeling Ed was seeking from the murders and the aftermath was a sense of complete and utter control and possession of another person. You know, possibly it was one of the few times that he ever felt in control of his life. Well, that's what we unpacked today. It's a lot. Um, Coming to the end of his murder spree, um, as he pointed out, he says that his girlfriend was the main reason why he was, you know, stopping doing it. And when we pick up next week, we will finish up with everything that happens at the end. Which is a doozy of an ending. If you don't know the tale about Ed Kemper, hold on to your hats. That's all I'm going to say. But, okay, so social media for me. Um, Give us an email, you know, if you want to send us a message or have a question or just say, hey, what's up? Please send us an email at addictedtomurderpodcast at gmail.com. Check out our Instagram page. So, uh, you know, we like to post a lot of stuff there. Leave a message, DM us, you know, like, all that. For our our other platforms, um, YouTube, TikTok, Facebook, and Twitter. Yes, it's Addicted Addicted to Murder Podcast. And I don't know if I said that Instagram was that Addicted to M Podcast. You didn't, but now you did. Now I did. I finished it all up. Um, Yeah, I think that's that's it. Did I forget something? Do Do you have anything to say before we end for the day you know i think that we covered it okay sweet well um everyone be safe and we'll see you next tuesday bye bye